Thanks. Thanks to you all for being here tonight. I can't see any of you, but uh, I know you're out there. Um, uh, it, this has been a, a, a very special week for me, and it's, it's made uh, even more special by my invitation to be here tonight. It was, it was 20 years ago uh, that I, just by coincidence, met a fellow who told me about the University of Dallas, and I thought, that sounds like a great place. And he also handed me my first issue of First Things magazine. And I have been a subscriber ever since. Of course, for the last 10 years, I've been publishing poems and book reviews in its pages, which has been uh, a thrill. And it's uh, such an honor to represent the magazine here before you tonight, as it is an honor to be invited to join all of you here at the Covenant School. I'm going to be reading to you tonight, which can be a little bit tiring. But so if you feel the need to stretch your legs or anything, do anything to keep awake, uh, please do it. Um, but I, I hope the story I'm going to share with you will be something that you'll find uh, enriching. Making the long retreat in August 1880, the poet, Catholic convert, and Jesuit priest, Gerard Manley Hopkins, kept a notebook record of his spiritual exercises. There he writes of how acute is the taste of myself, of I and me above all things, which is more distinctive than the taste of ale or alum more distinctive than the smell of walnut leaf or camphor, and is incommunicable by any means to another man. He concludes, searching nature, I taste self at but one tankard, that of my own being. The occasion of these notes is the, prop is the proposition that man is created by God and created to praise to turn upon oneself, to encounter one's existence as a distinctly first-person experience seems one clue to the mystery of our creation and our ordination to life in joy before God. Whatever the smell of the walnut leaf may reveal to us, we feel our own being infinitely more closely and clearly. You may step aside to do this all night tonight, I'm afraid. Um, what seems a gift and the beginning of a rich mystery will elsewhere be felt with all the dead weight of leg irons. In one of his aptly named terrible sonnets, Hopkins will write of waking in the solitary darkness of the night. He turns to his heart and says, what things that heart has seen, what ways you went, his life has been lived in such darkness, his cries of anguish, mere letters to a god, alas, far away. If it is some consolation that he can dramatize this sorrow by speaking to his heart in the second person, it soon vanishes as his words turn back upon the self and describe the bitter taste at the bottom of that isolated tankard. And here's from the end of this poem you see before you. I am gall. I am heartburn, God's most deep decree bitter would have me taste, my taste was me. Bones built in me, flesh filled, blood brimmed the curse. Self yeast of spirit, a dull dough sours. I see the lost are like this, and their scourge to be as I am mine, their sweating selves, but worse. The taste of self is a bitter curse. His self is like yeast within the dough of spirit, souring all with which it intermixes. The sonnet concludes with an analogy. The damned in hell are punished for their sins, as Hopkins is punished in this life and in the same way. Their sweating selves are the scourge. The self itself is the solitude of hell. Early in Paradise Lost, John Milton has Satan insist, as he stands amid the darkness visible of hell, that the mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. This bit of dexterous cheering oneself up only lasts until book four, when Satan is forced to conclude that heaven is no longer an option. Wherever he goes is hell, because I myself am hell, says Satan. Hopkins, if it's possible, goes further than Satan. To be a self is hell in itself. That may seem an odd conclusion, but it's one to which Joseph Ratzinger long ago gave a certain endorsement. 
I propose that Hopkins gives expression to one dimension of a very familiar dilemma. We inhabitants of the modern age drink deeply of the tankard of self and do so by no intrinsic necessity at the expense of the loss of the soul. I'll return to the reasoning behind this notion of loss presently, but first I want to define these two words, self and soul in themselves. In Georg Friedrich Kirstein's great painting, Man Reading by Lamplight, we encounter a refined romantic expression of what it means to have a self in the modern sense of that word. The lamp in this room burns for the man alone, its shadows casting up nets upon bare walls. He perches in his chair, upright and absorbed, rather than at rest, his back straight and right hand serving to hold back the unkempt locks from his forehead. Everything about him serves the concentration of the gaze upon the book itself perched precariously on the edge of his desk and held open by one hand. The room is crowded with furniture and so seems as if it should be full, but it does not feel full. On inspection, we see why. The bookshelf, the bookshelves at the back right contain shadows within shadows that may be books, but they have retreated outside the lamp's circle of light and are further obscured. First, by the diagonal projection of a lectern with a closed volume, and second, by a tall set of shelves in the foreground, each loaded with a closed box. The bottom such box is feathered by a stack of discarded manuscript pages. On the side table, to the left foreground, is a box open to the light, its interior lined with white silk. It is probably a box for stationery and is, in any case, empty. The room has space to contain much, but all it contains is containers, forms intended to contain, but actually containing nothing. Whatever of substance might fill them up, it would seem, will have first to pass through the illuminated, concentrated gaze of the man, or be composed by him like those loose leaves of manuscript. The room indeed is a model for his mind, a place intended to hold much, but whatever it holds must be made by himself and for himself. We can see no doorway out. A pole string descends dangling in the very center of the room. If we follow it up to the ceiling and across, it leads to a heavy curtain. The room must have a window. But the man could look outside that window, but no light enters. Though the curtain is raised, the window of the self is closed upon its own emptied but self-reflective interior. A proper romantic painter, Kirstein discloses to us a conscious, sophisticated interiority with all its sense of thinking for oneself, making meaning for oneself. The room seems empty and closed, but not stifling. There is room aplenty for shadow play, the self could be a land dense and deep with ideas. It has room enough to contain myriads. Dark outlines of things obscured, but perhaps once known, the cast off artifacts of knowledge brought to being by the mind at work crowd the margins, whether as burden or promise. The beauty of such selfhood lies in its seemingly distinctive light and freedom, even amid obscurity. But Hopkins was right to find something terrifying within. Could anything ever penetrate that solitude to fill up the empty shelves? There is self-absorption, but also self-doubt in those green walls. This is indeed an image of the self as the modern world conceives it. A mind alone, it must discover whatever fills its blank shelves on its own. Poetic in its defiant solitude, it would refuse the aid of anything outside itself and must in any event because it could not ever contain what comes from outside its walls in the same way it does what first comes into being within them. From the time of Descartes, this view of the self has been deemed in some sense heroic. The single reasoner who at last discovers truth obscured by a credulous collective history the individual at liberty, who would do all things for himself and on his own, scorning the purported beneficence of the past outside himself as a tyrannical encumbrance. <laughs>
As Kirstein's painting suggests, it is often portrayed uh, as a Byronic or tragic kind of hero, uh, heroism. Whatever else we learn, we never will know it as intensely as we know what Hopkins called the taste of self. Whatever actually comes to fill that self will always be suspect. If it can sit on the shelf, then it may well have come from the outside. However vividly the painting captures the interior, we may have no idea what awaits us beyond it. And so, the emptier the room comes to appear, the more jealously we guard its contentless containers as our one certain knowledge and its interior space as our one certain good. Such melancholy thoughts have stood behind many of our characteristic modern projects. From psychoanalysis to health foods and advanced medicine, the care of the self, meaning the preservation of the self in its enclosed existence and empty freedom, has become the only unquestioned public good in our day. Contemporary philosophy and social science consistently delivers the verdict that the self in its every specific feature is just a social construct, a mere product of often subtle expressions of cultural power. This leads not to self-renunciation, but to an ever more anxious and consequential effort to do justice to the self. Used thus, the term justice means merely to enhance the self's liberation from everything outside of it. The advent in our political discourse of the language of bodies and of safety, safe spaces, you've heard these words, brings to its logical extreme a theory of selfhood that takes even the imposition of the body as a kind of socially constructed marking from which the self must somehow be set free if it is ever to realize itself in total freedom, if it is to become its own cause of self-creation. Hence, in the present moment, we are continuously reminded that everything that might define a self is an imposed burden, that there can be no authentic content to the self, and yet we are ever more excitedly told that we must be true to ourselves, to be authentic, as if there were anything left in those emptied boxes on the shelf to which we could hold ourselves accountable. But have a last look at Kirstein's painting. On the desk, just beyond the horizon of the man's stare, sit two miniatures. Their specific form, like every specific form beyond the lamplight, is obscured, but not entirely. One is sketched with a golden circle that has a white point at its center. The other is mostly darkened but a light form proceeds outward and down from a central vanishing point, as if it depicted some kind of bright triangle. Such simple geometries smuggle something into the room of the self that may not quite belong. That they are perforce reduced to simple shapes first suggests that they resist conforming to the supple and subtle lines of Kirstein's painting as a self-portrait. But second, in this they also remind us of another way of depicting the self. In Botticelli's great painting of St. Augustine in his study, we find many of the details later to appear in Kirstein's picture, including the human self depicted with vivid, humane depth and subtlety. The central figures are in rough, similar po roughly similar poses with several key differences that we shall study now. Kirstein's man is romantically heroic, his body slightly fine in an unworldly and wasting kind of way. While Augustine's form ripples with strength, the veined olive hands hinting at thews beneath those flowing robes. In all this, his are the heroic magnitudes of a man in the Renaissance. But it is not what makes this a typical Botticelli that interests me, so much as what it captures of a more ancient and enduring view of the saint. He holds a writing tablet in one hand, is clearly in the act of composition. But his eyes, far from being concentrated on his self-generated thought, are angled upward, a powerful hand clutching at his chest, but also gesturing out from it. So that we see, however powerfully present he is within the scene, his thoughts have already transcended the limits of the canvas. All about his flowing robes stand more rigid and exact geometries, the mitre signaling his authoritative role as bishop in the church, 
the open and ornamented rectangles of texts with geometrical diagrams indicating his learning of certain truth, the draftsman's tools showing his knowledge of and participation in the architecture of the faith, <coughs> the armillary sphere representing the knowledge of the ordered beauty of creation, the cosmos. At the right margin, a fluted column suggesting his possession of Roman, of classical civility and civilization. And all these things beneath the image of a cross whose cruciform shape has been extended outward so that its burst or aureole of glory is now fully revealed and one with the suffering, even while it remains girded with a crown of thorns. Augustine's inwardness, every bit as fully realized as Kirstein's, is one that categorically turns outward to the order that situates his being and in which he participates. As physical form, robust man, Botticelli's Augustine is a self, but that self can only be known through its relation to everything else. And in this, we see Augustine as having a soul, as the very image of what it means to be ensouled. The soul grounds the self, not chiefly by vouchsafing it as a thing apart, but as a reality already participating in an order that precedes it, that places it in relation to the hierarchical uh, whole of reality, and that subordinates it to the order revealed by the cross. The composition of the painting shows all things, however disparate in themselves, working together, holding together in this divinely ordained order. It is the soul or rather in the being formed by soul, that we are ourselves not through some self-establishment and self-sustained privacy and primacy, but entirely through our grounding and participation in a created or cosmic order. As the philosopher Charles Taylor argued long ago, Augustine is just that figure in the Western church who first demonstrated that a self-reflective inwardness was no end in itself but just a necessary means to discovering our participation by way of the soul in God as truth, goodness, and beauty. The soul is not primarily the object of one's self-discovery, though it certainly is the answer to the question about itself that the self may pose. It is rather the means by which we come to see our placement in the order of reality of which we are a part and whose structure we must understand if we are to be brought to our intended end. To put matters too simply, I propose that our age has bartered away the soul for the exclusive primacy of the self. It has lost all sense of the soul as an existence ordered to participation in reality that transcends it, replacing that with a care of the self that at once senses the weightlessness and the emptiness of the self, even as it can recognize nothing else as a truth to be known or a good to be cherished. Such a lament will sound only too obvious to some of you. It will sound a non sequitur to others. After all, the self and the soul are not mutually exclusive. When we utter the phrase, I myself, we sense a tautology intended to reinforce a particular identity, a first person experience of unity expressed, in, as Popeye might have put it, as I am I. In contrast, if we should say something like, I'm worried about my soul, we indicate a concern for something proper to our I, in some sense more important than it, but not identical with it. We understand what Hopkins might mean to suggest that the lost are lost just because they have lost their souls but been left with their selves. Further, the classical imperative to know thyself, first Plato and then as we see Augustine, understood as a command to understand one's being in terms of the nature of the soul. The soul, they say, is the answer to the question, what is my true self? What is more, they propose that the result of knowing the soul fully and ordering it properly is to be called self-mastery. In such formulations, the truth about the self is the soul, and the two are to be understood together and not apart. There should be no competition, but only, for the good man, harmony. But to the contrary, we have constructed a competition such that two great misfortunes have befallen us. First, on the whole, 
we feel bound to understand the self as radically apart after the fashion of Kirstein's painting. We sense something precious and primary in its value, even as we suspect that sensation may be a lie, as we falter to ground it in anything other than the vaporous, if intimate, experience of our subjectivity. This misfortune will be again familiar. But second, even those of us who affirm with Augustine the grounding of the self in the soul often have inadvertently redefined the soul in merely subjective terms. The soul explains the value, it justifies the value of the self by grounding it, but it no longer signifies as clearly as it does in the painting of Augustine. Our position, not as enduring or true entities, but as mere participants in a larger order to which we belong, but which is not our own. We come to think of the soul as a justification of our worth, brought in at the last moment to explain the otherwise elusive sense that ourselves are somehow irre of irreplaceable value. But conceived thus, we obscure the meaning of that worth. This has in turn a broader, not to say a graver consequence. As we've already noted, our age clamors vociferously for what it calls justice. In every instance, those cries insist on our doing justice to ourselves. They are destined only to get louder, I'm afraid, as it is discovered that every supposed justice granted seems to make visible some new injustice imposed upon the self. For such persons are asking for something that is not possible because it is not really justice. Justice to the self is in this sense an attempt to escape from justice and indeed to stand apart from everything outside the self. We might better characterize it as indeterminacy, autonomy, solipsism, or even nihilism. How the modern age arrived at an insecure but absolute concern with the self and a disfigurement or even erasure of the soul has been rehearsed many times. Rene Descartes' misappropriation of St. Augustine led him to reinterpret the idea of looking inward as a prerequisite to perceiving the order of reality as a whole as leading simply, leading to the simple conclusion that there will never be anything that we know with such certitude and intimacy as the experience of our own first person subjectivity. All other knowledge of things, if it can be called such, must be mediated by self-knowledge. This led in turn to what the philosopher I mentioned a minute ago, Charles Taylor, has called the imperative to disengagement. If knowledge of what is beyond us is mediated by the self, we only arrive at knowledge itself by disengaging, as it were, the data from every trace of ourselves. Consequently, the true picture of the world comes to appear as one in which there's no place less for us and where the very notion of self comes to seem a subjective intrusion and the soul a non-entity. In later thinkers, the self comes to be understood as the determined product of physical forces, as in 19th century materialism, and of social forces, the so-called social construction of reality I mentioned a minute ago in 20th century philosophy and social science. I wanna pause for a moment to think about the poet W.B. Yeats, who for one reason in particular is very important for uh, explaining this phenomenon of the replacement of the self with the soul that I've been describing. Yeats was early deprived, as he says in this passage, of his religious faith by 19th century materialists, Thomas Huxley, Darwin, uh, Darwin's uh, bulldog, as he was called, and Tyndall, a figure of the same sort. Uh, Yeats wrote, I'm very religious and deprived by Huxley and Tyndall, whom I detested of the simple-minded uh, religion of my childhood, I had made a new religion, almost an infallible church of poetic tradition, passed on through poets and so on and so forth. This is a very interesting passage in itself, but I just want to draw your attention to something that's suggested but unanswered. He doesn't believe in anything, but he's very religious. What does that mean? He's been robbed of his faith by materialists, but he's still very religious. What does that mean? What it ends up meaning for Yeats is something very simple. He affirms with 
the modern world the existence of the self. But he also, in despite that modern world, affirms the immortality and therefore the reality of the soul. In his late poetry, he will make a, um, a project of flirting with what it means to assert the self even as you cling to a belief in the soul. I'd love to read this complete poem with you. Uh, it's Yeats as a dialogue between self and soul, but I'm just gonna make a quick observation. We have the soul speak first and say, come to me, I am the source of your immortality. I am what's permanent in you. And the self says, yes, I am what dies. But, says the self, soul, you're rather boring. And so the self gets the last word, and what a long word it is. What has Yeats just done in this poem? Has he affirmed, despite the modern age, the reality of the soul? Well, yes. But he's done something to the soul that I think, I'm going to argue in a little bit, perverts it. He has justified the existence of the soul as our immortal substance only so he can justify the misadventures of the self. Because you have a soul, what the self does matters. But also, because you have a soul, the mistakes, the errors, and the travails of the self take on a significance, a value, that they wouldn't have if ourselves were composed of mere matter. This is what it means to be religious for Yeats, to affirm the soul in order to justify the self. So, the soul is real. As Oscar Wilde once put it, the soul is a terrible reality. Yeats affirms all this, and he does do it in a way that's consonant with what we might find in the works of Plato, or certainly, or in Augustine. The soul is immortal. Every death of self will be followed by another birth, because the soul is not going away. The soul, not subject to time, but outside of time, serves, therefore, no purpose other than to make possible the continuous renewal of the life of the self, the value of the self. And so the soul grounds Yeats's defiant act of what we may call self-assertion. Life consists of humiliation, shame, rebuke, stumbling into folly, sin, and error, says Yeats. And he will do it again and again, Yeats's self affirms, so long as he may keep doing it. This proclamation culminates at the end of the poem in what sounds like beneficence and beatitude. We are blessed by everything, Everything we look upon is blessed. But is it really thus? The beatitude of all things lies merely in their being serviceable for the experience of the self. Yeats was a, a real um, a prototype or anticipation of what we saw in the 1960s where self-actualization and transcendence were voiced in a very high sounding language but really just meant the assertion of the self and its desires. Yeats's poem looks back to the classical conception of the self and soul, but only so as to give some ground, some plausibility, to the poem's resolution in conceiving of human life as a defiant act of self-assertion. In this, he follows Friedrich Nietzsche in thinking of the self as a fundamentally aesthetic experience in which we form and reform ourselves, take care of ourselves, and merely for the sake of experiencing self-satisfaction. The soul serves, therefore, only to guarantee that the fluctuations of the living self may continue, that is, be renewed by death and rebirth within the, soul, the world. The immortality of the soul is the ground of self was Yeats's religion, and he would preach it poetically even to his deathbed. But if Yeats's obsessive concern with the soul seems a little bit eccentric, it had at least a, plaus a plausibility to it that's quite lacking in the intellectual tendencies that have succeeded him. The difference between, say, what we might call here the Nietzschean Yates and the, Nietzsche, the Nietzscheans who f have followed him and who even now dominate our culture is that the latter would see the soul itself as, an, as yet one more imposition, standing in the way of the self, engaging in pure, total free acts of self-assertion. In this 
approval of the self as its own end, we find the source of those vacuous summons I have already mentioned regarding being true to oneself, being authentic, or even, again, looking back to the 1960s and 70s, 70s the call to be self-actualized. The actualization of the self categorically and formally replaces the fulfillment of the soul. On the surface, this may appear a new birth of freedom. The self, unshackled from the soul, loses its sense of grounding and endurance, but gains the possibility of becoming whatever it wishes by means of a will, a self-assertion untethered from anything outside of itself. Like the man in Kirstein's picture, this can be viewed as a heroic condition or a cause of mere pathos and terror. Or so the advocates of the modern self wish us to believe. I would interrogate such wishes by turning to a work often cited in Lamentations of the Modern Social Condition, but not normally drawn on in reference to questions of spiritual import, such as those I've been discussing. Aldous Huxley was the grandson of Thomas Huxley, that same Darwin's bulldog who deprived Yeats of his Christian faith. His best known work is a dystopian novel entitled Brave New World. Most people will be familiar with the basic details of Huxley's imagined world state. After a series of catastrophes, democracy has been rejected in favor of a totalitarian government in which stability is the sole political and psychological good. The prophets of this world are a confusion, a mismatch of, of Ford and Freud, managerial efficiency, and the therapeutic removal of every unnecessary barrier that might stand in the way of a freely taken pleasure. Its citizens live lives of detached complacency from artificial birth and a hatchery through childhood conditioning, a lifetime of entertainment and anesthetics rooted in liberal doses of the drug Soma, and on to one's death in a ward circumspectly sheltered from the view of society. Huxley's somewhat mechanical guided tour of this world eventually introduces us to four protagonists. First, and most prominently, we encounter a, a man named Bernard Marx. Undersized and unattractive, Bernard senses that a life of uninterrupted pleasure must be a superficial and deluded one. He is ill at ease in this world of fake, lying happiness and senses that the passions aroused by pain and suffering must somehow be a clue to a more authentic way of living. He seeks solitude and silence, and even to stand in contemplation before the tumultuous dark waters of the sea, convinced that some mystery lies within it all. He is drawn to a woman named Lenina Crown, who is in every sense a typical denizen of the brave new world. Beautiful, she stands out only in being reasonably attracted to Bernard and would be perfectly willing to share herself with him. Everyone, as their child condi childhood conditioning teaches, belongs to everybody else, after all. Bernard's one friend is Helmholtz Watson, a propaganda engineer. While Bernard sees through the bromides and benumbed intoxications of the world on account of his not fitting into it, Helmholtz is set apart by what's called mental excess. He sees through it, understands it, and commands it, respecting every sign of cleverness, of intellectual superiority as desirable. Lastly, we meet the savage. On a trip with Lenina to a reservation in the American Southwest, Bernard encounters a white-skinned savage named John, whom we soon learn is the one naturally born child of civilized parents left in the world. Childbirth is regarded as smutty, and John's origin's a cause of shame. But when Bernard brings John back to the civilized world, Bernard himself becomes a celebrity, and John a figure of fascination. Wild and unkempt, John has read and quotes Shakespeare from memory, and has inherited from the savages among which he has been raised a belief in God, in Jesus Christ, and in the soul, though he knows next to nothing about what these words mean. There are two common interpretations of the novel, uh, and they're based on its most obvious features. In some accounts, it's compared with George Orwell's 1984 as a story of authentic individualisms being suppressed by an absolute and tyrannical state. As Huxley once wrote to Orwell, on this reading, the difference between the two novels is whether conformity would be implemented by force and coercion 
or by the soft medications of gentle therapeutic drug-induced administration. What's more tyrannical, Stalinism or advanced liberalism? Another account of the novel is somewhat more compelling and depends upon a simple comparison of authentic and inauthentic selfhood. The world state allows its wards to live lives of bloodless, consequence-free pleasure. Everyone, as it were, enjoys the middling bourgeois pleasures of life without any of the bourgeois hang-ups that Freud is supposed to have diagnosed. Standing in critique of all this is the truth of pain that Bernard only suspects and which John, as this romantic, noble savage, brutally raised among brutes, yet graced with a fierce independence, self-mastering discipline, and a silver tongue borrowed from Shakespeare, seems to manifest. On this reading, Huxley has given us a choice between tame complacency and wild authenticity, between a clinically managed civilization and a painful and erratic but sublimely exciting freedom for the assertion of selfhood. Between self and self, it seems, we are asked to choose. But I don't think this describes what the novel actually shows us. Huxley gives us four characters, each of whom represents a vision of human nature and of the human good, the purpose of life. Lenina, as the typical member of the brave new world, understands her being purely in terms of the self, which for her means specifically the body and its punctual pleasures. She moves through the world without regret, forgetting the past and proceeding from delight to delight with only her body as a source of continuity. Bernard, at first, seems to be more complicated. He embraces suffering as a prophecy of truth, but only until he's able to escape from suffering through his newfound celebrity. He seems to identify authentic selfhood as the body plus powerful passion. But as soon as he can have whatever he desires as easily as everyone else can, all that had seemed to elevate him above his fellows disappears. He thought he relished pain. He was really just rationalizing the pain forced upon him. Helmholtz seems to have a firmer and superior sense of self to Bernard's. He looks on the latter with pity, and when he recognizes the genius of Shakespeare's language, he comes to admire the savage. We soon learn, however, that he sees in such language only a superior form of propaganda. Shakespeare's language is no revelation of the mystery of love through beauty. In fact, Helmholtz finds the romantic love of Romeo and Juliet to be gross and silly. It is simply a more perfect means to intellectual power. For Helmholtz, authentic selfhood is the body coupled with superior uh, cleverness or practical intelligence. Reason used for power and effectiveness better to rule the body and the bodies of others. Together, these three characters suggest that human life consists of a self constituted by A, the life of the body, our bare existence or being, B, passion or will, and C, intelligence or reason. And its good is either uninterrupted complacency, the intensity of powerful feeling, or the exercise of rational control over the world. John the Savage, from the beginning, stands apart from all this, but it's not clear why, even to him. Like Yeats, he is very religious, but not in a way informed by understanding. Rather, his people worship within a syncretistic cult of Christian and Indian religions that are more a set of rites and disciplines than beliefs. But entrance into civilization will soon reveal something of the inner meaning of the words he has until now only spoken. In a seemingly disconnected scene, early in the second half of the novel, we see a man named Mustafa Mond, the supreme ruler of the world state, reviewing scientific articles for either publication or censorship. He skims one called A New Theory of Biology that proposes life may be understood by a conception of purpose, by which is meant what Aristotle called final causality. Life may be ordered to some good beyond the present human sphere it proposes, an end that consists not in the maintenance of well-being, the care of the self, but of a refining of consciousness. Mann judges the article brilliant, but heretical, and so it is not to be published. After a series of misadventures, including instigating a riot, John is brought before Mustafa Mond. 
The ruler of the world introduces the solitary savage to the meaning of those words he has merely memorized and recited before. First, by showing the savage a copy of the Bible, and then of the imitation of Christ and of uh, William James's The Varieties of Religious Experience. But then he reads to John from a sermon by the blessed John Henry Newman, which meditates on St. Paul's words that we are not our own, we are God's property. He then recites a passage from the French philosopher, Man de Berlin, to the effect that when young were consumed by the life of the body, but the gift of age is that, as the body falters, our souls are freed to turn to God. What has the savage learned at the feet of civilization? His fellow protagonists have indicated that human life may consist of a self composed of being, will, body, will, and reason, but that the self cannot harbor those things for long. The self is passing even now by way of forgetfulness, the exhaustion of passions, the turning from one practical object to the next. No, these three things only gain their integrity and true stability when rooted in that which can properly belong to God, that which situates us in an order beyond ourselves and which directs us beyond the flux of life to a life beyond the world. The alternative to the total conquest of the brave new world is not rebellious passion or superior thinking, but the subsistence of the soul as participant in an order that transcends it. Like Yeats before him, Huxley was shaken by the reductive materialism for which his grandfather had agitated, permanently marked by its force, but also anxious to overcome it he undertook a decades-long study. A bit over 10 years after publishing the novel, Huxley would study Eastern and Western wisdom and mystical traditions, gathering choice aphorisms into a volume he called The Perennial Philosophy. He sensed, however imperfectly, that the foundation for the brave new world had been laid by the superficial and feeble assertion of the self to constitute the whole truth and value of human life. Without techniques for the cultivation of the soul, human beings would be prone, as Bernard, to lapse into an infantile care for the self. The weakness of Huxley's project may be found in its resemblance to Yeats's. He could go little farther than to ground the self in the soul so that subjectivity might gain a firmer spiritual dignity. He would eventually develop a significant body of undogmatic spiritual writings that are worthy of study. And yet, his later interest in psychedelic drugs suggests that the quest for the soul, when it is not primarily a quest to contemplate the order into which the soul fits us, as Augustine showed, might all too easily be reduced to one more intense experience of self-assertion. The doors are supposed to begin playing right now, but I'm going <laughs> to... I guess that, that, that was a technical malfunction. Um, I, I put up on... Uh, for you to see the cover of the perennial philosophy, but also this book, A Guide for the Perplexed by E.F. Schumacher, um, which I, I won't talk about other than just to recommend it. Um, it's, it's written by a fellow who was, a, who was a, a Catholic convert. He was sort of a disciple of Huxley's, but he saw through some of the weaknesses of Huxley's uh, work. And it's a, it's a book I recommend. Um, it's something I use with, with my freshman students because it's, uh, it's really an introduction to Christian thinking and to the Christian philosophical tradition, and it aims at a reader who believes in nothing but the self. And so it's a wonderful book for young people in our day. Some may hear these remarks that I've made tonight and find the fundamental assertion a little bit quaint. Has not the focus of philosophical and theological anthropology long since turned in response to the evident thinness of conceptions of selfhood, from the nature of the soul to exploring the depths of that rich, very rich word, personhood? For my part, I do not think that I'm being quaint, or I wouldn't be standing here. In Plato's dialogue, the Phaedo, we hear Socrates pondering the immortality of the soul in the hours just before he drinks the hemlock and dies. The central question at first appears to be just that which concerned Yeats. Does the self in some way survive the death of the body? 
Does it have a soul, or is the soul identical with the self, a mere effluvium of the body destined to perish with it? Poignant as this aspect of the dialogue certainly is, in the corpus of Plato's work as a whole, the immortality of the soul is but a point of entry to the discovery of the true mystery of being. His Phaedrus, for instance, argues that the soul is just that feature of our being that marks us as knowing self-aware participants in an existent order that precedes and transcends us, one which orders not merely our individual selves, but the whole cosmos. Our everyday use of the term, my soul as distinct from myself, is quite right, Plato suggests, because there's nothing especially personal about the soul. That we endure, that we are immortal, is the least of its mysteries. The true mystery is that the good generates the splendor of truth, that is to say, beauty, and this beauty in turn confers an intelligible order, a government of beauty upon all things, and in which all things live, move, and have their being. The soul does not primarily serve for Plato to establish the proper unity of the self as transcending our ephemeral, disintegrating bodies. His foremost concern is to learn what the soul indicates about our roles as beings within a, within a cosmic pageant of being. To realize this order through the soul is to participate in justice and to enter upon a great quest whose path has already been mapped. Indeed, after demonstrating the soul's immortality in the Phaedo, Socrates concludes by outlining the moral architecture of Hades within which souls, virtuous or vile, may properly dwell. That is no sooner has he shown that the soul has an immortal life than he turns his attention to how that life participates in the order of the good that rewards and punishes injustice. No assertion of the self can compensate for the loss of this vision. It cannot attain to a tragic beauty. It can at best rebel for a little while before it lapses into the inured and absent-minded hedonism of Lenina Crown. There is no justice for the self but we may indeed participate in justice through the knowing of the soul. It is only by way of the soul that we participate in the order that extends beyond ourselves. It is in the perception of that order that we first envision justice. It is through our participation in that order that we may also participate in justice. And so we cannot do justice to the self because there is simply no such thing. Justice for the human being is our being ordered by and ordering all human things to that divine ordinance in which the soul by its nature already participates. As Kirstein's painting suggests, there's something splendid and brave in the soul's capacity to know. But as Botticelli shows us in his depiction of Augustine, our foremost knowledge is of the soul, and it is through the soul not that we turn inward upon the closed certitude of what Hopkins called the tankard of the self, but by way of which we arise, turn outward, to participate in the order for which each of us is destined. Thank you.